Hi everybody, I'm Bill Brennan, welcoming you to another edition of Honolulu on the Move, the show that brings you the latest news and information about the Honolulu Rail Transit Project. The construction market here in Honolulu is a hot one in 2015 and is likely to add some increases to the projected budget for the remaining work on the rail project. Hart is taking actions to address the financial challenges that may lie ahead while continuing to make progress on the construction of the first half of the guideway and the rail operations center in Waipahu. Hart Executive Director and CEO Dan Grabowskis and Honolulu Mayor Kirk Caldwell recently discussed both the progress and the challenges on the Hawaii Public Radio call-in talk show, Town Square, hosted by HPR's Beth Ann Kozlovich. Thank you both. Hey, Beth Ann, thanks for having us back on. I always enjoy coming to Town Square and talking well, story with your listeners. Nice to have Thank you, you here. Great to be here. And nice to have you back too, Dan Grabowski, because it's been a little while. Thank you. So this time last month, the December Board of Directors meeting made the announcement that the overruns and they were going to be pretty lengthy, and you also had an action plan to reduce those costs. For about a year, though, some of the revenue from the surcharge has been at a deficit, too. Mayor Caldwell, did you ever stop to think at some point maybe this project would be in trouble? No, Bethan. In fact, you, you talk about the shortfall in GT collections. is something that was brought to my attention when I became mayor by Dan, and we actually started to meet with the Department of Taxation to see if we couldn't get a better handle on why is GT growth, the slope of the growth for the state of Hawaii, is, is a pretty steep slope. And for GT collection for rail, it was a lower slope. It should be parallel in each other because Oahu with a million people, with Oahu with the military, Oahu with most of the visitors coming here, Oahu with all this construction, we believe that we should have a stronger slope and be collecting more GT than we we're collecting. So we worked, reached out with the previous administration. Um, we got some information, but not a real good understanding. And since David Ige has become governor, I've gone over to sit down with him. We've talked together. And as you know, the governor is very passionate about making sure that all taxes that are owed get collected. And so he says he's willing to work with us to see why there is this shortfall now of about $40 million, between 41 and $40 million, and see if we can't reverse that curve because it's critical to make sure we have all the money we need and that everyone is paying the tax so we build this system that we committed to build. Did you have any indication why those two taxes weren't tracking each other as they, they should have been? Well, they, they explained um, that there's a lag, that because it, there's a lot of manual operations at Department of Taxation where they actually open envelopes, that it was a matter of opening and posting and that they'd catch up. But if that was the case, both slopes would be the same, right? They'd maybe be a gap, but would be paralleling each other. But actually, the slope falls away from the state collections. And so there's another story there. We don't know if maybe some folks aren't paying it or if some folks who have operations on all islands are paying, you know, moving the payment over to a neighbor island to avoid paying the half a percent. We're not certain. And all we're asking for is let's look at some tax returns. Maybe let's look at some type of audit to answer some of those questions. You know, a good slice, take a 1,000 returns filed on this island and see what it shows. And I think we'll get a better handle. That has not happened, and I'm hoping we'll get that opportunity. Those would be random I would propose that, that, random. that would be audited. Yeah, that's what I would propose. And those would be average people and businesses. That's correct. For some people, that sounds scary. Well, I think everyone should be paying the taxes they're supposed to be paying. Um, we do in this room, and I believe others should too. We'll find out. Maybe they all are paying. But then there has to be another reason why we on Oahu would be getting less of our GET share than we should because we know we know that with unemployment here, it's almost 3.5%. That's almost full employment. Our unemployment is much better than the neighbor islands. So I don't see why we shouldn't actually, our slope should be steeper than the state slope because we are generating so much income on this island. Dan Grabowski, the, the surcharge is a smaller portion of this. It's got a story in, in, in itself, but... Looking at the cost overruns and looking at how much more the rail project is going to cost us now, and even looking back into some of the reports that were done five years ago, seven years ago, and, and the changes in the numbers, I mean, one can clearly see that it's always costing us more. And here we are in 2015. Who knows what may happen in the next four years? How do you project in any sort of way to take care of what's happening 
in the last little while, and what's the shortfall there, and uh, somehow safeguard against the future. Well, people, I'm sure, can uh, reasonably see that when you have a mega project that has many millions of dollars, lots of moving parts, and and occupies many years between uh, the conception, the design, and ultimately the construction, uh, you have ups and downs in the economy, you have changes and circumstances that, that you have to deal with. So you do the best you can to try to project into the future. Um, over the life of this project, we've seen some very favorable bids come in. When the first bids uh, in the first couple of uh, uh, ten, the first 10 miles of the guideway came in, for instance, those bids actually came in under our estimate back in 2009 and 2010. So those were very favorable. Um, what we're doing now, unfortunately, is that as a result of delays, um, some because of lawsuits that halted our project, we've now been shifted into a different time for our bids. So we're bidding now in a very hot market. Uh, where we've got a lot of competition for other vertical construction. Um, we're competing in many ways against those high-rises in Kaka'ako for the businesses who are looking at you know, construction companies to do work. So we're seeing um, these costs rise. We opened the bids um, for the first nine stations uh, last, fa last fall, and that was really a tipping point for us. We'd monitored things like the GET lagging slightly behind. We'd monitored uh, another negative indicator, which is we had these delay claims, and we were negotiating them and paying those claims out. But it was really when we opened the, the bids for those first nine stations that we realized we're now bidding the final 40% or so of the construction contracts in a very different market than was anticipated back several years ago uh, because of the delays. So um, as a result of that, we've recalculated and recalibrated what we believe the future costs of the project will be. And it's from those numbers that we were able to put together a projection of, um, of a between 550 and $700 million dollars a total of about five to ten. Uh, this would be about ten to fifteen percent off of what the total cost projections would would have been, primarily driven by the GET lagging, by the higher bids, and by these uh, delay claims we had to pay. Delay claims totaled about uh, will, will have totaled about one hundred and ninety million dollars by the time it all is said and done. So, we've survived a lot. Legal battles have been fought and won, um, but they have cost us a lot of money, and they've cost us time, which is in some cases now. Uh, costing us even more money. You've talked about repackaging some of the bids. Usually consumers are told that if they bundle services, they're going to get a better deal. Why is repackaging and sort of disentangling some of these services from each other going to actually make a better deal for us? It's a great question, and, and usually it is counterintuitive, right? You buy in bulk and you save. The interesting thing is there are some unique challenges we face um, in construction here in Hawaii. We are not able to just readily ship equipment from one state border to another or have people who can commute from one state into our state uh, to work. We are an island. And so we have basically um, ch a challenge by finite resources on the island, or if we need to bring resources onto the island, it's very expensive. So one of the things we found from talking to the construction companies was that the construction companies here um, are not all mega companies. And if we have a mega bid situation, uh, it's going to be very difficult for them to participate. And what, and what is more significant is that the subcontractors that they would hire, the local companies that we want to employ on this project, um, found that the nine stations together was just too big for them to bid on. So we had very little competition among the subcontractors and subsuppliers. What we learned was to right-size these projects um, and these, these bid offers for Hawaii and maximize what we can leverage here, we've taken the nine stations and broken them up into three packages of three. And from the interviews we've had with construction companies, we believe that um, they, local companies and local subsuppliers, will now be able to participate um, more uh, uh, with more competition, and that should help us to drive down some costs. So, yeah. how do you maintain? Excuse me, yeah. for both of you, is, how do you maintain some sense of constancy then, if with you know this package of three and that package of three and that package of three, so that all of them have obviously the same specs, but also uh, the same level of quality? Uh, you do that through the bid uh, pri the bid process. Uh, another way to look at it is you're also not putting all of your eggs in one basket with one company that might not be the best company to work with. So, um, so what we're we're able to do is um, manage individually those those contracts. You can go you can go to the other extreme. We wouldn't break them into nine I separate or individual contracts. That's probably um, too cumbersome, too much management. But the three packages of three seems to be maybe the this we hope the sweet spot for the businesses here and the local companies that can compete on these projects. Was there any thought to do that in the beginning, that that might be a better rationale? Um, you know, again, it's uh, 
people sat at a table and sort of competed to think about whether or not bigger meant better because of economies of scale uh, or smaller uh, and right-sizing them might be better. Um, it was discussed, uh, the idea was that sort of bigger was better. We found out that that wasn't the case. So we're halt we halted that, uh, that uh, bid solicitation, we canceled it, and we're doing what we think the industry is telling us is going to give us the lowest price. If you're just joining us tonight, we're talking about the progress and the challenges of Oahu's rail project. Mayor Kirk Caldwell is here, also CEO of Hart, Dan Grabowskis. And you, too, if you have a question and you'd like to join our conversation, the phone lines are open, 941-3689. If you're on Oahu, use that number, 941-3689. And from the neighbor islands, 877-941-3689. Mayor, you wanted to jump in here a I moment ago. I just wanted to emphasize one thing. I think the breaking of these contracts into smaller bid amounts is a good thing for our, our local workforce. Um, as Dan mentioned, when these mega contracts were put out, you had to have mega companies, some of the largest construction companies in the entire world, bidding. And yes, we got great quality work, but some of the opportunity was lost for our local companies. And I believe that by breaking in these, the, the nine stations and the three packages of three stations each will give more opportunity to create greater competition and hopefully reduce the bids. And I wanted to say the first bid package went out last year it's going to be open in February, correct, That's Dan? Right. That's right. And we're going to see whether, having done that, what's the competition like and has the cost come down? Because when it was a nine-station bid, the low bid was 63% higher than our anticipated budget. Some folks said, why didn't we wait until this new bid came out before we talked about these cost increases? Because we'd have a better measurement. But both Dan and I believed to be fully transparent, and we agreed when we, I became mayor, became executive director, we're going to report all the good news and the bad news. So we did it in December to share with the public what our concern was and what we were going to be doing to try to address it instead of kicking the can down the road and hoping the next bid selection would come in lower and then talk about it. And I, you know, I think it's the right way to be, and this is going to be a dialogue we're going to continue for the remainder of this project which goes to 2019. Well, there's some callers who would like to be dialoguing with both of you. We're going to get you in on The rest of the show was dedicated to the questions and comments of the listeners of the program, and they ran the gamut. Everything from security cameras to power from Hawaiian Electric was discussed. The very first question concerned Hart's rail cars. I'm very pleased to report that um, the rail car manufacturing uh, is uh, exactly where it needs to be. In fact, um, we, while we look at the columns and the guideway here on o, uh, Oahu and the progress, um, the first rail car began manufacture at a factory uh, in November uh, in, in Italy. The, f the, the company that we've hired to do the manufacturing is called uh, Ansaldo Breda. They're an Italian company. So they'll be f uh, framing out the, the rail cars in Italy and then shipping them to uh, Pittsburgh, California factory for final assembly. Um, we hit two really significant milestones, um, Aaron, in the last uh, six months. One was we completed the substantial design in the late summer of last year, and that was very important for us to hit. And then the next significant milestone was to actually begin the assembly of the rail cars in November, and we hit that milestone as well. Uh, we just recently had a group, a team of our uh, folks go to the three factories in, in Italy that are manufacturing components, including the one that's assembling them, and they report back... Uh, they were on schedule, very high quality work, and things going very, very well. So that translates into the fact that that first rail car in a few months will go, or that frame will go to California. It'll reach final assembly in December of this year, and we can anticipate the first rail car arriving here in Honolulu in the first quarter of next year. So just about a year away from now, people will actually see one of our first trains arriving here. You know, with each passing year, more and more people are relying on public transportation to meet their transportation needs. I recently had the chance to talk to the president and CEO of the American Public Transportation Association, or APTA. That's the nonprofit group that represents many of the agencies and authorities in North America. His name is Michael Milanofi, and I asked him what is the state of public transportation as we head here into 2015. We're seeing huge ridership across the nation. Last year there were 10.7 billion trips on public transportation. It's the highest number since 1957. To give you some perspective on that bill, there were 700 million trips on all public, on all uh, aviation last year. 
700 million in aviation, 10.7 billion on transit. We are making a huge difference. Why, why do you think that is? What do you attribute that to? We're seeing a big push. People know they need to have options. They're tired of driving an hour and a half in their leased car in traffic, waiting to get somewhere they want a better choice. And as we're seeing on both ends of the genealogical spectrum, they're making choices. On the one end, the millennials are saying they don't want to own a car. They want to be able to be more economically uh, efficient with their dollars, better environmental footprint, and be able to live in a community that's walkable and has transit options. At the other end of the spectrum, our baby boomers are saying they don't want to drive far. They want to be able to live close, be with their friends, close access to health care and part of their communities. The cities, the people are saying they want to move into downtowns, into their communities, into transit communities. It's making a difference. In addition to meeting transportation needs, public transit also provides an economic boost to local economies. The public transit industry is a $58 billion a year industry. We have over 400,000 people directly employed in transit, but we have tens of millions that work ind indirectly because of transit. We have supply bases all across the country, but another economic number that's really important and is going to be huge here in Hawaii is this. 42% better economic performance was found by the U.S. Uh, the National Association of Realtors when looking at residential housing stock along high-frequency transit corridors. What that meant is if you had a house along a rail line, it performed 42% better during the economic downturn than those homes that didn't have good access to transit. Their, their values went down less and they came back faster. Being near public transit is just as good as having oceanfront property. And here in Hawaii, you can have both. What a home run that is. Right. But that basically says people want to live near public transportation. They want to live near public transportation. They want to have access and options and be economically viable for their family. Milanifi says in most cities that are adding rail transit to their public transportation mix for the first time, as is the case here in Honolulu, there'll be opposition. It takes bold leadership to create transformative projects. Anyone can do easy projects. Big, hard projects take big, strong leadership. And you've been very fortunate to have that here in Hawaii. It is very normal for there to be opposition. If we look back to the Golden Gate Bridge, people were saying it would be an eyesore. It's going to hurt the San Francisco Bay Area. Look at how it has transformed that community. They couldn't imagine life without it. And that is just an example of the many, many things that have seen, we've seen in big projects across the country. I can assure you this. After the first segment is built, the questions that will come up will be, when do I get mine next? Yeah. It is so common across the country, and it's going to happen here. Milanifee praised the determination and perseverance of the late Senator Dan Inoue for being a champion of Honolulu Rail Transit. The senator is without question, a was a tremendous leader for this community and for this project. You have to have a strong champion, a champion who will be there for years, will be there to lead and to inspire. Yeah. And there's no way to put enough words around how important his leadership was. And it is great to see the legacy of his hard work going forth with this project. And while congressional support for public transportation is certainly a key factor, Milanifee says it's just one component necessary to make public infrastructure projects happen. The Hart Project is a great example that it takes a partnership. You have to have a local investment, have investment from the states, and investment from the federal government. When you put these things together, great projects can happen. We're seeing that here today. We need a long-term sustain sustainable funding source for public transportation and for all service transportation in North America. And we urge Congress to work with us on a long-term six-year bill so we can make investments in our future. Right. And how, how does that go? Is, is, is public transportation neither Republican nor Democrat? Is it something that, that uh, elected officials in, in our nation's capital can, can see the value of? What's great in this country, we have a long history of transportation being a nonpartisan issue. We all need good access to transportation, whether it's in cars, boats, planes, trains, whatever it is, we need good public transportation options. And it's a nonpartisan issue and will continue to be for many years to come. Milanifee had the chance to take a tour of the Honolulu Rail Project, and he came away with this impression. Well, I'm so impressed by the quality of the work, the commitment to safety, but also how this community has embraced the system and how the system is embracing the culture, that it is a key part of how this system is being built along the 20 mile alignment. To see how we're gonna have access to jobs from the west side and be able to bring access to jobs into downtown. To see the availability of options and housing and business so that we are gonna create, create transit oriented development along this alignment. It is gonna transform the city of Honolulu and the greater island for better for this community.
think how exciting it's going to be as a future for them to have transportation choices, to not have the only choice be get in a car and get stuck in traffic, to know they can jump on a train and zip downtown and go to shopping and to jobs and education and, and theater and things that are part of their community, to have those choices, to not be tied to one option. It's so exciting. We are creating a bright, economic and sustainable future for our children and it's a wonderful thing. The proposed 20-mile elevated fixed guideway begins at the East Kapolei Station with a park and ride. This is adjacent to the planned Department of Hawaiian Homelands residential development. It follows North-South Road to the next stop, the UH West Oahu Station with a park and ride. The route continues through Ho'opili to the Ho'opili Station. The route continues onto Farrington Highway, past Hawaii Medical Center West, travels over Fort Weaver Road to Waipahu's West Lock Transit Station at the Leoku Street intersection. It continues down the median of Farrington Highway at approximately 30 feet above street level to the Waipahu Transit Center Station near the Mokuola Street intersection. Passing Waipahu High School and the preferred site for the maintenance and storage facility. The next stop along Farrington Highway is the Leeward Community College Station. The route then crosses over H1 to the Pearl Highlands Station with a park and ride. Commuters from Central Oahu will have a dedicated access ramp from H2 to the transit station. The guideway then continues within the median of Kamehameha Highway, crossing Waimano Home Road past Pearl City Shopping Center over H1 over Waimalu Stream to the Pearl Ridge Station. Continuing along the median of Kamehameha Highway through Aea, the route continues in the median of Kamehameha Highway, serving the Aloha Stadium Station with a park and ride. Continuing on Kamehameha Highway, to the Pearl Harbor Naval Base Station at Makalapa Gate. Around the Pearl Harbor Interchange follows H1. To the Honolulu International Airport Station. Continues on Aolele Street to the Lagoon Drive Station. Follows the edge of Keehi Lagoon Park over Nimitz Highway to the Middle Street Transit Center Station. past Pu'uhale Road into the Kalihi Station. It travels along the middle of Dillingham Boulevard over Kapalama Stream to the Kapalama Station at Honolulu Community College. It follows Dillingham Boulevard to the Ivile Station, turns onto the median of Nimitz Highway past the Chinatown Station at Keikaulike Street. then into the downtown station near Aloha Tower. On to Halekawila Street, to the Civic Center Station on South Street. Then, on to the Kaka'ako Station at Ward Avenue.
it continues Mauka onto Kona Street to the final stop at the Ala Moana Center Station Terminus. That's going to do it for today. On behalf of all of us on the project team, mahalo for joining us, and we'll see you again next time for another edition of Honolulu on the Move. If you have a question you'd like us to answer on our next Honolulu on the Move show, go ahead and hit us up on Twitter or Facebook, just two of the places where you can stay informed with up-to-date information on the Honolulu Rail Transit Project. And you can view our latest project videos on our YouTube channel. If you'd like more information on the project or would like a presentation to your group or organization, give us a call at our project hotline at 566-2299 or contact us via our website at honolulutransit.org. You'll be able to keep up with the latest news and information about the project, important meeting dates, times, and locations, and examine the official documents that are guiding the project's planning and construction. Take some time to visit honolulutransit.org. <laughs>